This is your Libertarian Crusaders, episode number 28. This is our, what, what do you call it, John? Um, this is one of our most important episodes, I think, <laughs> is what, you, what you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> Coronavirus, uh, self-isolation, lockdown, you name it. This is our first uh, Zoom virtual meetup, and it's great to have uh, Jacob Hornberger here. Uh, to start this uh, new format of our show. Uh, I want to say thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for being uh, a Virginian. <laughs> You're not that far, apparently. I had no idea that you were in Fairfax, of all places. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, it's nice to be here. Uh, yeah, where are y'all? Richmond. Oh, okay. <laughs> I used to be an Arlington person, and then I got tired of all the, the people, so had to move down to Richmond, so. To the, to the good part of Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to also live up in uh, Nova, so all over Northern Virginia, from Annandale, McLean, Falls Church, uh, you name it. So, yeah, down here, it's like a weird high school musical part two, because eventually <laughs> Nova people come down here. Um, so I guess we wanted to ask you, uh, how's your isolation going are you isolated are you uh do you think it's a hoax do you think it's real could it be both a hoax i mean could it also be real and that government is always looking for ways to push more of their control over people well yeah i mean government's going to do whatever it can to expand expand its power and crises and emergencies are the time-honored way by which they do that because that's when people are afraid and, and the framers and our ancestors who got through the Bill of Rights understood that. And that was why they, they didn't have a, an emergency or crisis exception in the Bill of Rights and in the Constitution because they knew that's what happens. But no, I think it's a very serious thing. I, I think it's a real game changer here as far as um, short term our lives go. I mean, this thing seems to be so infectious and, and nobody's immune from it. I mean, you got the rich and famous and powerful that are catching this thing. and dying from it and I don't know I can't decipher yet whether the rates are as big as they say because when you when they compare it with the flu and other things it doesn't seem like that significant but in terms of uh, what it's doing to ravage society I, I think it's a very serious thing I I also think though that their their cure for this tyranny and oppression is the absolute worst thing they could have ever you know the uh you get we get the criticism a lot um oh libertarians you know you guys are really losing on this one or something look at the great government response to this and how um but i you know i sometimes wonder if we had a libertarian as president what is that what does that look like you know what does that response from the president look like if it's actually being respectful of the constitution and our our fundamental liberties well you know whenever you get a crisis that's that's caused by government or magnified by government, people will come up to a libertarian and say, okay, well, how would you do this? And, and we see this like with education. Well, how would you all run the public schools to get rid of the education crisis? Well, libertarianism has never been a philosophy that purports to tell people how to run their socialist status central planning systems. What we stand for is an entirely different system so it's not surprising that you've got these this perfect storm of dysfunctionality taking place here. You have a very dysfunctional uh, economic system that has left pe many people without savings to get through a crisis like this, with the IRS looting them and and uh, to fund this ever increasing welfare warfare state. And this has gone on for decades now. And so, look, people don't have any savings. Then you've got a highly dysfunctional healthcare system based on central planning, which is a socialist concept. That's what the Center for Disease Control and the FDA are all about. And Trump, they're, they're all planning this thing in a top-down fashion. Uh, that's what's called a central planning system. That's why you have shortages of masks and ventilators and so forth. Then you've got this central planning system in the monetary sphere where the Federal Reserve is just flooding the, the economy with newly, paper, uh, newly printed paper money which is gonna result in a massive devaluation. So somebody asks us libertarians, well, how would you run these systems? Well, we wouldn't. We're no <laughs> more competent than, than Donald Trump or Joe Biden. What we stand for is a free market system. And so a libertarian president would say, look, let's start building the foundation right now before this thing happens again for a healthy free society. So we would have a healthy economy by getting rid of the mandatory charity, the IRS, the income tax, 
People now start saving money. Separate healthcare in the state. Get government totally out of the healthcare business where the dynamics of the marketplace would be responding and they would be guiding the healthcare industry would be guiding us out of this crisis instead of these politicians are running around with their chickens with their head cut off. And then you have a free market monetary system where the Fed's not plundering and looting people through the debasement of the currency. So what I'm doing in my campaign is I'm, I'm making the case that libertarianism is an entirely different system. If you like what's going on, vote for Biden, vote for Trump, you're going to get the same thing because they both subscribe to the same system. If you went out of this morass, join up with us libertarians because we'll lead you out through freedom, liberty, prosperity, harmony, health. And that's, that's the only solution to this thing, freedom and free markets. You don't feel uh, swayed to give up all your uh, God-given rights for a $1,200 check? <laughs> <laughs> no, That's it's not really, enough. <laughs> what's really funny about this thing is that I think, the Repu wasn't it the Republicans making fun of Yang for proposing a $1,000 check for right. everybody? And now who's the big leader of the $1,000 check? Well, they made it $1,200. It's the Republicans. I mean, this is the thing you cannot ever count on Republicans when it comes to liberty. They will throw in the, the towel at the first sign of trouble. Mm. Any emergency, they immediately capitulate. It's incredible. I mean, yeah. um, with the, there, there's a couple of these programs coming out, like the uh, Small Business Administration Stimulus, a $350 billion program. That's just a drop in the bucket compared to some of this stuff that they're proposing. But when you see programs like that, I know a bunch of people who work at small, small businesses, and uh, they see it like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get this because it's like free money. And, um, and yet, you know that there's, there's consequences for that. They can't just create all of this money out of thin air and, oh, now we're all more prosperous, right? <laughs> yeah, it really is fascinating. I mean, it's just a gigantic racket. It's a sham. Because remember, before the crisis, we were looking at a government that has, is $23 billion, trillion, trillion dollars in debt. Um, billion or trillion? Trillion, yeah. Trillion. $23 trillion, okay. yeah. $23 trillion. And then Trump was spending $1 trillion more than what he was bringing in. So here's another big spender who, who was going to you know, pay down the debt when, when he was in office, and he was going to be different from Hillary Clinton. Well, he's turned out to be no different from Hillary. But here you notice you've got a government that's spending more than what it's bringing in. Mm. Well, so all of a sudden they find $2 trillion extra money. I mean, like, were they hiding under the bed? Were they, was it like a rainy day fun? Well, and then people fall for this, and it's rational. I mean, they're being offered free money. Uh, wow, this is going to tide you over. But, of course, the cost is around the corner. Now, what they're doing here, it's a big racket, that when the big corporations and the politically connected people, the people with lobbyists on K Street and Washington and so forth, those that, you know, lick the shoes of the Congress, they... Uh, they saw that immediately they were going to suffer huge losses. Everybody was going to suffer losses, but they were going to suffer monumental losses. So they immediately come up with this word stimulus. And, and it was just a big racket to tax everyone and give them the lion's share of the loot. Now, they're giving everybody $1,200 just as a palliative to you know, keep their mouth shut, get them happy. But whenever the Fed's printing the money, and that's where they're getting the money, they're just going to they're print money like it was going out of style. The first people to get the, the money, they're, they're fine because prices haven't started rising yet. But then the people at the bottom, people on fixed incomes and stuff, they may be getting their $1,200 check, but when they find that their money buys very little compared to the before the stimulus package, then they're gonna, that's when the cost is going to be paid, when prices start rising across society, because that's the only way a devaluation of the currency can take place. So it's just a, this whole thing is a great big racket to line the pockets of the wealthy, the big corporations and the politically connected. Right. I think, uh, you know, why do we need to send uh, Nancy Pelosi's uh, Pork Barrel Project uh, $25 million to the uh, JFK Kennedy Center Performance of Arts? Like, are they going to be doing ballets and opera through all of this? You know, is that something that is uh, essential, right, to something that they're saying that this is a panic, a pandemic uh, a uh, state of emergency all across the country that we need to give $25 million to JFK uh, performance of arts. Right. Yeah, no, I'm sure there is so much personal 
pork barrel in this thing that it just defies it boggles the mind right the untold there'll be untold amounts of fraud too i mean with the applications with um that are going in for these small business administration loans people are coming up are going to be coming up with like anything they can to bump up the amount of loan that they get and say yeah this uh, so and so works for me i was paying him you know and this whole time so uh it's just it this is what government does it, it, you know the most unscrupulous people are drawn to it so that they can get their slug you know, oh, yeah. right. it's high X concept of why the worst get on top. And, and you're, you're seeing this in just throughout this whole thing. And, and it reminds me also of Frederick Bastiat's famous dictum that the state is the great fiction by which everyone tries to live at the expense of everyone else. And that's what's going on here. You know, everybody's trying to get his hands on the loot, but everybody's paying for it. That's what's so funny. They, we just block out of our minds that government doesn't have money of its own. It has to tax people. And in this way, they're taxing people through inflation. Uh, right. What do you think of uh, Northam's response to all this, being a Virginian? Do you think he's gone too far? Do you think uh, it's too far in terms of the way how it has affected businesses and people's way of making their own decisions and uh, handling the situation? Of course. But, I mean, it's typical for him. And don't forget, this is the guy that wants to confiscate everybody's guns. Right. Um, right. Why, why would be, we be surprised that he, he chooses other areas to destroy liberty as soon as the uh, crisis comes around? Exactly. I think they, he extended the stay-at-home order until, I think, June 10th, yeah. like the day right after the uh, primaries uh, were oh, to take place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, coincidentally, right. So it's supposed to be take place on like I think June 9th, but he did it June 10th to make sure everyone still stays at home, you know, to kind of push back uh, the threat. It's very uh, Machiavellian, and I'm glad you brought up uh, the gun rights issue. I was going to ask, um, what do you think uh, in terms of it's gun issue? Is that a state issue? Is that a, a Virginia culture issue? Right? Is is that an attack on Virginians, or is that just to uh, plus state uh, Democrats and kind of push an anti-Virginia culture into our state? That's a good question. Let, let me go back to the first thing about his, his edict, you know, about the, his shutdown edict, because, you know, it's, it's classic dictatorial conduct. I mean, this is what uh, Augusto Pinochet used to do. Now, here's your model dictator uh, that the CIA has um, put into power after they ousted the democratically elected president of Chile. And this guy didn't have a legislature to worry about. And so he would just issue a decree or an executive order and that was law. That became the law. So they became known as decree laws. So whatever the decree was, was automatically the law. Well, notice that, that Northrop just issues a decree doing the shutdown. And, and what's fascinating is that he creates the penalty for it. This is not a, it, it's a one year in jail, potentially, if somebody gets arrested mm -hmm. and convicted of this thing and a thousand dollar fine, he just makes this up. I mean, he just makes the decree and then puts the penalty. I mean, it's, it's harder to get more dictatorial than that. It'd be one thing to go to the legislature and say, can I have a law that gives me this authority? But man, th this is bad news. And um, this, yeah, go ahead. You were going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Uh, and the way that he's going about is creating this kind of air in which uh, people are kind of reporting each other to the police, for example, is kind of a uh, weird evolution of the idea that any one of us could be terrorists or carriers in which now you have to report to the, you know, Northam Gestapo uh, to find them or put them in prison for a year. Uh, it's a weird way of creating internal communism. Well, that's fascinating. I haven't heard of that. So we got our snitches working. Right. <laughs> no, you, you see, I, I went many years ago, I went to Cuba and I got a license from the treasury department said, I want to study this socialist system there before it goes away because the, the Cold War was over and the, and, the, and the Soviet Union had dismantled. So I thought, okay, here's my last chance to see a socialist society. And they had, they, the way they organized their neighborhoods, they had neighborhood snitches. So they would be the official designated snitch that would report whether somebody was charging too much for something or just doing something improper. And the, I, I met, actually, there were libertarians in Havana that I, I encountered and I went out to dinner with them and they told me, but every, the snitches know that if they cross a line, some, the neighbors are going to meet them in the dark alley. <laughs> right, right. 
Uh, yeah, and your gun rights thing, I mean, I, I think it's just this nationwide phenomenon. I mean, Northrop's your classic Democrat that thinks that if they confiscate guns, that's going to eliminate violence, when he doesn't realize that the root of violence in America is the drug war. I mean, that's, that's causing massive violence. And then my, I've long held that the death machine that the U.S. government's been waging overseas with the support of both Democrats and Republicans killing massive numbers of people with no regard for human life, that that has seeped into the, the consciousness of people over here in the subconscious, which is manifesting itself, I think, in these copycat irrational killings over, mm. over here. But, but that's what Democrats do. They see the violence, and instead of getting rid of, the, rid of the violence, the root causes of the violence, they want to confiscate guns, which, of course, disarms peaceful, law-abiding people. It, it gives government the ability to exercise more tyrannical powers uh, if they don't have to worry about a well-armed citizenry. So yeah, it, it's, it's a fantastic thing that, that the gun rights people at least stopped them uh, so far with respect to their, their making um, the ownership of an assault rifle a felony. Right. So, with um, you know, Trump recently talking about the confluence of the drug war as well as our aggressive foreign policy you know, now in Venezuela, right? We're sending ships down to surround Venezuela and we're going to fight the drug war, but we're also going to fight a war. And this is all happening during the coronavirus pandemic, like, which is supposed to be the thing we're all concerned about. And uh, it's just amazing, like the way government keeps finding new, um, new priorities, new things to spend money on. I mean, um, I, I don't know what to make of it. And, and just the average person, when they see what government is doing, is like, no, that's okay for them to be doing that. And I shouldn't have guns either. You know, I, I don't understand. <laughs> oh, it, it boggles the mind. I mean, here you have all these people dying here. And juxtaposed with all this death here is all the death taking place in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Somalia, and Syria. And it's like surreal. I just wrote an article on my campaign website, uh, jacobforliberty.com, that entitled Donald Trump, just another um, pro-death president. I mean, mm -hmm. because, you know, they're, they're all pro-life over here, protecting the rights of the unborn, fine. But they're just pro-death overseas. They don't give a hoot for the value of human life if, if it's a foreigner. And now, as you say, they're going, the military is going to Venezuela to supposedly to enforce the drug war, which is illegal here in the United States. Posse comitatus prohibits the military from en 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 engaging in law enforcement. The American people have spoken and saying, we don't want the military inv involved with law enforcement. And, but as soon as they, they lose, they, they leave American shores, they say, well, we don't give a hoot what, what Americans feel like. We're going to do it anyway. Because we can, because we can, and so they're going down there. But we all know it's just a re, an excuse for a regime change operation, like they did with Manuel Noriega from Panama. It's just a repeat of what's going on here. But what boggles my mind is that they are they are botching everything here with respect to the treatment of this coronavirus thing, and and their mind is oriented toward how can we start a war with Venezuela so we can kill more people over there. It's just weird. It's a weird uh, distraction to say that we're always at war with Oceana. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will ask, um, and you're, you're mentioning the, all these uh, gun issues. Um, you know, the entire gun rally of over 50,000 people that convened in Richmond from people all over the country, you would think that all this democratic and liberal talking points that leads to mass shootings, uh, no one has been, no one was shot that day. And when you look at, uh, what's going on now and you have this enormous amount of people now realizing the importance of being able to protect yourself because government may not, cannot. Uh, so all these mass uh, purchases of guns, right? The gun stores are still considered essential services, but we don't have still any of these mass shootings going rampant uh, despite that. No, that's a great point. And it really is interesting that people are I mean, there's going into gun stores and buying everything they can uh, right. as, as a means of self-defense, not to go out and start shooting people. And if you look at Switzerland, the Swiss are among the, the best armed people in the world. I mean, everybody's got an assault rifle in this house. Everybody knows how to do it. They're all great shooters. Uh, and they train them. I mean, the kids grow up learning how to shoot guns because everything's oriented toward the defense of their country. Everybody right. knows to where to go in case of an emergency. And nobody jacks with the Swiss. 
But, but notice that they're not in Iraq, Afghanistan. They don't right. get involved in all that stuff. But nobody jacks with them. Even Hitler would not dare to invade Switzerland because he knew that his forces would get chewed up. Uh, his generals told him that uh, we can't take them, but you will no longer have an army. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the, the fact that people have guns in a widespread way is not the cause of the problem. The, the cause of the problem is something else. Right. If uh, Northam called for a uh, ban on all guns, would you join a Virginian militia and join us in uh, retaking and liberating Virginia? Well, yeah, I guess you're raising the issue of civil disobedience. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, that's a tough issue. And I, I've struggled with that one for many, many years. Is What is the line that would have to be crossed for me to first to engage in civil disobedience. And then right. what Jefferson talks about is the right of revolution. Um, and I think that's got, uh, even Jefferson points it out that, that tyranny has got to get pretty bad before you go that route because it's so costly. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's lots of lot, massive loss of life. And, and, but what is that line? I really don't know. I, I, I I'd have to decide that for myself. Now, peaceful civil disobedience. I got no problems with that at all. Right, right. I mean, you find, uh, you know, before the American Revolution, which uh, kicks off in a, historically in a couple of days, um, you know, and when it like the shot heard around the world is I think like uh, five or 10 days from now um, in this month of April. But yeah, there was a lot of uh, the line getting closer and closer leading up to that from the Bass Boston Massacre to a lot of other incidences before they like this is enough, <laughs> you know, uh, all these uh, suspensions of our liberties and what people have died for in terms of our rights, God-given rights. Um, at, at some point, I think, uh, you know, you think that the whole blackface incident would have been enough to impeach him. But, you know, I guess he has shown that he, anyone can weather any kind of storm or controversy as long as you don't quit. Um, and I'm not saying like tomorrow we're doing anything like this, but yeah, I think at some point it's something for Virginians to consider is like, what, do we control our own, our own destiny or do we let outsiders who are not part of uh, the Virginia culture to, to control us? And if we do, um, I'm certain that we would not be on our own. <laughs> if we can do like a coalition with Texans, <laughs> they're always about uh, secession and do a co-opting of, um, uh, I guess, relations and pushing that together. <laughs> Well, that's true. And, and, you know, your point about Concord and Lexington, I mean, the, the line drawn for them was they were coming for their guns. I mean, the, the, right. British, the British knew what they were doing, that if they could just get everybody's guns, then they knew everybody's got to be obedient and compliant and do whatever they're told. And, and the colonists knew that, too. They, they, they knew if we give up our guns, we're done. And there, there's a famous uh, um, Court of Appeals decision. I forget what it is, but, um, uh, and I forget this, the justice. I think it was maybe Ginsburg. No, it wasn't Ginsburg. But justice wrote a, a dissenting opinion in this gun case where he said, you know, anybody, any society that gives up its guns can make that mistake only one time because you'll never have the opportunity to make it again. Right. They will not, they, you can't go and say, hey, we made a mistake and we have our guns back because they're not going to let you have your guns back. Well, and I, I've been reading a little bit about the history of um, Ireland in the 20th century and just their struggle with being able to access guns, to be able to find guns. They had to break into armories, risking their lives in order to take guns from the British um, military, you know, in like the 20s, 30s through the 50s. Um, and it's just a, you know, it's, it's an insane policy. They would be so much better off. They probably would love the idea of just every home having some guns dispersed all over the country, you know, as opposed to having to risk life and limb, <laughs> you know, back then anyway, to, uh, to try to procure some, some guns. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, and notice how Northrop is, Northam has done this thing. I mean, it's just really fascinating. They just, they want to make it just a felony offense, which then puts everybody in a very awkward position. I mean, do you risk a felony conviction to keep those assault rifles? Uh, I mean, that doesn't mean they're going to come and get them. But I mean, right. Right. it's like when Roosevelt nationalized gold coins, uh, do, you, do you take the risk and keep your gold coins? I mean, suppose there's a fire in your house and somebody comes and finds your guns or your gold and man, all of a sudden you're looking at a penitentiary time. Right. I'm glad that the uh, moderate Democrats had some common sense to realize that if these bills were to have passed, 
you would have had that boogaloo. You would have had, like, there would be one crazy Appalachian guy say, no, come and take them. And uh, mull on the lab. And <laughs> it would have started off. Um, I mean, maybe it's delaying the inevitable. I mean, of course, we don't want bloodshed. We want to find a peaceful way to do that. I mean, as, as much as democracy is, has been a cruel joke on a lot of people, make everyone into their slaves and masters of their, over each other, it has allowed for an interesting way of peaceful transfer of power instead of through violent force, through history has kind of been known for. And maybe we can go and have this peaceful transition uh, through the political system, which is uh, your involvement and engagement in. Um, I think um, I was going to ask, uh, what do you think of, um, uh, I guess, in your transition right now and in, in seeking the nomination as president, uh, who would you choose for your uh, VP? Oh, gosh, I haven't even gone down that road. I mean, <laughs> I'm focused on winning this nomination, and uh, so it's, it's way too early. And I, and I got a fight on my hands. I mean, this yeah. thing's not – yeah, I mean, uh, there's 10 candidates, and uh, we're all fighting hard for this thing. I mean, nobody's letting up at all. So the time for thinking about that, <laughs> it ain't here. Um, yeah, it's got to be hard enough with the um... – it was, you know, Biden and Trump, I guess, in their campaigns. I haven't heard anything out of Biden recently. Uh, nobody, but but for a libertarian, a third party presidential candidate to have to navigate this, I mean, nobody's ever seen anything like this. So what what are, what are some of the challenges you're facing and where do you think, I mean, I think this is a great format to get, you know, to get uh, our favorite candidates on, you know, Zoom and YouTube ch- uh, shows and then we can, we can beam them out there. But um I mean, what, what are some other things that you're, you're looking to do? Well, I'll tell you, I, I really miss the traditional format. I mean, I'd, I'd, gone to, <laughs> I'd gone to 18 state conventions since last November 1st. And, uh, and before that, I'd been attending state conventions, maybe about eight or nine or so. Uh, and I love the energy of the crowd in these. De- I did, I've done eight presidential debates since then. And you can just feel the electricity in the party. I mean, you can, I mean, it's just the energy and I get energized by it. I get my batteries charged up and as a speaker, I mean, you can feel that in, a, in an audience uh, and all of a sudden it just gets shut down. Uh, it's just, uh, wow. <laughs> but we're, just, we're not letting up for a minute. So we're reorienting toward the internet. Uh, so we're doing uh, podcasts like we're doing here today and we're doing uh, articles. I'm writing a, probably an article every other day. I just started a new video series, which are little short video commentaries on where we are in this coronavirus thing and and dealing with healthcare first. I'll be going to the economy and uh, monetary policy. Uh, We do a Tuesday night, ask me anything format uh, at at nine o'clock. It goes, sometimes goes for two hours because we're being hit with so many questions. And I love that. That's a lot of fun. Uh, And, uh, so th- I think that's pretty much it. That and we're we're just orienting everything to the internet. What brought you to uh, to, to want to run in, in this person? Why why what brought you to like? I have like the capacity. I have the energy. I have uh, the commitment uh, to drive home the message of liberty and to uh, ignore the competitors and the people, all other people seeking the nomination. Uh, what makes you be the the one that can bring us to this place of closer to freedom? Well, the reason I decided to run is I want to be free. I mean, I, I, I've, I've fought for liberty for 30 years now, even longer, but 30 years at the Future of Freedom Foundation, which is a nonprofit educational foundation that I founded in 1989 that advances a pure, uncompromising case for libertarianism. And I should emphasize they don't endorse my candidacy. They, they can't do that. They're a nonprofit. But people can get a sense of my commitment to liberty doing that. And, I, and that's what I've been doing for 30 years. And I love it. I mean, I just, I'm the luckiest guy in the world to be able to do for his hobby a vocation, like a profession, and get paid to do it. I mean, it's just been fantastic. But I, I finally decided, you know, I, I want to take these people on more directly rather than in the educational arena. The political arena provides that opportunity to just take them, take the case right to them as to what they've done to, to, to this country. And so I said, you know, the, the political arena does that. I'm going to seek the party's nomination. If I can win that nomination, I'm going to take this battle right to Trump and Biden as to what they've done. And this corona crisis is perfect for doing that. 
because, you know, people now are going to get focused. There's nothing like the prospect of death to focus people's attention. And I'm, if, if I am accorded the honor of this nomination, I'm going to, I'm going to hit them right there with that question that if you like what's going on, go ahead and, and vote for Biden or Trump. There's not any bit of difference at all. You want out of this thing, join up with me because I will get you out with free markets, liberty, and private property, the heritage of what it means to be an American. Now, where am I different from the other candidates? Well, I am running a pure libertarian campaign. I believe that our libertarian principles are our greatest asset. There's, there's sometimes a mindset in the party that, and I served three terms on the platform committee, that are, some of our principles are albatrosses, they're liabilities. I have never believed that. I think they're our greatest asset. And not only are they the key to a free society, they are the key to fixing the crises, to, to resolving, to ending the crises that Democrats and Republicans have forced it upon our land in immigration, healthcare, um, drug war, foreign policy. There's only one solution to this morass and that's libertarianism. So I take a very, very hardcore stance that, that I think most of my opponents do not take of, Get rid of Social Security. Don't reform it. Don't gradually reduce it. Get rid of it. Repeal it immediately. Get rid of Medicare and Medicaid, the income tax, the IRS. Leave people free to keep everything they earn. They decide what to do with it. 100% voluntary charity. People, that scares people, including libertarians. Doesn't scare me a bit. I have no doubts that liberty works, that people would respond. They'd help the elderly that need the help. Children and grandchildren would step up to the plate. Doctors would provide free medical care. Everybody would work together in a free society. Take um, the, the troops. Uh, the, the, many of my opponents talk about bringing the troops home from the so-called forever wars. I go further than they do. I say bring the troops home from everywhere. Korea, Europe, World War II's over, Africa, Latin America. Bring them all home, and I go one step further. Discharge them into the private sector. Uh, uh, dismantle the whole national security state, which is a totalitarian form of government. Uh, restore a limited government republic. Legalize all drugs, not just marijuana. This, this dr drug use and drug abuse do not belong in the criminal justice field. They belong in the private sector with Alcoholics Anonymous, therapy, counseling. So that gives you a little bit of an idea what kind of campaign I would wage. And I would take this battle right to these people, both of them. Trump and, and Biden and say, this is what you've done to our country. This is where you have left us. And then just pose the choice to the American people. If you like it, stick with them. If you don't, come and join up with us. Yeah, that's the dream. It's just the, uh, the, the image of Jacob Hornberger speaking to these guys on the uh, debate stage. I mean, Ross Perot was able to do it. And you know that, that to me would be a win, is if we got a libertarian up on the stage next to Biden and Trump and... Uh, they, they wouldn't be able to get away with all of the nonsense that they, right. they get away with. Cause you know, so much more than like Trump about <laughs> foreign and policy or, you know, or economics. It's so, it's so frustrating hearing these guys get away with all of the, uh, the, the foolishness that they, they talk about. And uh, so, that, I mean, I'm, I'm pulling for you. I really hope, uh, I hope the, the, the convention for the libertarian party is able to happen. Um, but I mean, are, are, is, there, is there any concern that that might not, or, uh, you know, is, is there any rumors? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of rumors and pretty reliable rumors, but let me address this thing about the debate because, you know, we, we've often talked about that in the party, you know, over the years, Oh, getting in the presidential debates. Well, you know, one of these days lightning may strike and, and all of a sudden the American people say, you know, we're, we're moving toward libertarians. And all of a sudden our poll numbers start rising. And let's say we were to hit that threshold. And the, then, then the real question is, and I think every libertarian has to operate on that assumption, because if you don't prepare with that assumption in mind, you're going to get caught flat footed with the wrong candidate. And so what I think everybody has to decide in this race is, do you want a presidential candidate representing the libertarian party in those debates that's going to say, yeah, I agree with President Trump and Vice President Biden that we do need to continue right. Medicare and Medicaid and income taxation and the welfare state. We're just, but we libertarians are going to reform them better or we're going to gradually reduce them over 100 years. Or, you know, to me, 
you're best off with the candidates can get up there and make the case for the free society and why why we can trust Americans to be free. Because, you know, that's really the, the argument behind these social welfare programs that they're telling young people, guys your age, they're saying you are bad people. You cannot be trusted with liberty. We know that you will turn your back on your parents and your grandparents and people in need. We need to force you to do this. And when younger people start finally start figuring out and saying, you know what, I don't need to be forced to be, do anything, then the support for these social welfare programs is going to collapse. And that's when people are going to start believing in themselves and believing in others and believing in freedom. Right. You open up a market of the way how we used to take care of each other as Americans before Medicare and Medicaid and before all the 1960 programs that did away with all these uh, free societies and ways that doctors provided cheap and easy access to uh, insurance uh, before the monopolization of it. So, yeah, you, you free up, you abolish that monopoly. It's like it's not like nothing will appear and instead uh, you'll have the heavy very interest of people who do care of each other fill in that void is um, I guess it's that fear that people think that without their social security there, there, there'd be nothing but you know they forget that you don't have a choice but to pay into social security <laughs> you, you don't have a choice to say no you don't have the choice to say I can have a better way to invest my own money and maybe understand that it's not just about abolishing social security, but it's also freeing up a lot more other options for you. It's not just uh, abolishing welfare, it's abolishing all these myriad forms of taxation that you you become richer for it. Um, and I think there's a lot of fear for a lot of people who feel like that they've were, have been forced to pay into it and they have they wouldn't be able to receive back, but they don't see like the bigger picture that you abolish all of that, you are 100% times richer for it um which kind of leads into some of the fan questions that uh, a few of them we wanted to ask you one would would be related to this topic what is your plan for social security beyond abolishing it uh, well there's not anything once you abolish it, <laughs> there ain't nothing there uh, but you know you, your point about medicare and doctors and stuff is really good because you see we grow up in this these systems and when you grow up in them, they all seem normal. And, and, and you're taught that it's freedom. So, you know, you go thank the troops for your freedom for this massive mandatory charity system. Well, how can you be free when you've got a system of massive mandatory charity? I mean, it's ridiculous on its own terms. If it's mandated, it ain't free and it's not charity. Right. If I could, I'd like to talk a little bit about when I was growing up before the Medicare and Medicaid. I, I grew up in the poorest city in the United States. Laredo, Texas. Uh, people were in shacks. I mean, there was real poverty there. Every day, doctor's offices were filled with people, uh, most of whom or many of whom could not pay. And the doctors knew it. And many of them were coming over from Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, where there was even more poverty. There was never an instance where a doctor turned away any patient for inability to pay. They just, they just did it because they believed it was the right thing to do. They were still the second wealthiest people in, in Laredo, second only to the oil people, because they were still making a lot of money because their, the income taxes were not extremely high. Uh, and, and healthcare costs were low. Nobody had major medical insurance. Somebody might have catastrophic. I don't think my parents did, because healthcare costs were lo so low and stable that it was like going to the grocery store. You just go in there and you, 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 know, you pay the doctor like you're going to the grocery store. And nobody worried about pre-existing conditions because healthcare costs for everything were so low and stable. You didn't need insurance. Medicare and Medicaid come along. That's what caused the problem. That's what destroyed this finest healthcare system. Prices started soaring. Uh, crises, doctors were getting all these weird associations, corporations, and so forth. And then you've got reform after reform, crisis, Obamacare, socialist medicine for all. The only solution to this whole thing, and I've said this for 30 years, you've got to get government out of healthcare entirely. And that would, would cause healthcare costs to plummet. You know, people t tell me today, well, I've Jacob, I've got this new healthcare plan where I get a MRI for $300 instead of $3,000. Well, if you'd have a free market healthcare plan, how about an MRI for 25 bucks? All right. That's, that was the system that, that we had. And then Social Security, you know, it's the same thing. We've lost faith in ourselves and confidence in ourselves. You get rid of all the Social Security administration. 
Think how much money that's costing that we're having to pay for in this process of having our money taken from us and given to, to elderly people. Uh, the IRS agents would no longer be in existence because you wouldn't need an income tax. And oh, by the way, this was our system for more than 100 years. No income tax, no welfare state, no Social Security, no Medicare, no Medicaid. No, there was never a case of people dying of starvation. Um, I mean, there was so much voluntary charity in America that some people were even complaining that there's just too much charity. We well, still that, had roads. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was our heritage. Uh, so I never, I never answered your question though about the uh, what's going on in the LP. Oh, okay, so here's what's happening. They, they're, they're controlled by their bylaws, and their bylaws say that they have to have a convention. And, and they can't amend their bylaws because to amend the bylaws, you have to have a convention. Mm. So one idea that has been proposed is to, for a few L LNC members or a few Libertarian Party members, go down to Austin, gavel the convention open, and then um, enact a plan to have an online convention. Wow. That, that's fraught with danger, though, because if you end up with... 50 people there for some particular candidate or Jacob Orberger. Well, yeah, no, well, <laughs> we wouldn't do something like that. Somebody would. They no, take, no, they take control over the convention and they get nominated and there's nothing anybody could do. All right. The second alternative. Well, you're saying this is a plan you support, right? Homeburger team, team. Homeburger. No, no, we're, not, <laughs> we're not supporting that. Either. I think there'd be a revolution if I want that. <laughs> Just as there'd be a revolution by if anybody won that way. Right. Um, I mean, he sir, I don't think anybody that won that way would get very much support, but that might not matter to somebody as long as they're the nominee. Right. But the second one is the LNC has the authority to name the uh, the candidate, both vice president and president, on their own. And from what I understand, I could be mistaken. They need a two thirds vote to do that. So that's pretty difficult. Hmm. Uh, now they could end up with no nominee at all, which is an alternative, which I think would really hurt the party. Um, I don't know if they could recover from that uh, because that's what gives them ballot access uh, in a lot of states. And then the, the final one is, I think the fairest, that's the one where they poll the delegates, they let the delegates vote, and then the LNC agrees to go with whatever that vote is. And it seems to me that that's, that's the fairest way to go. Yeah. I mean, we've all been working our butts off to uh, help the LP get on the ballot in here in Virginia. So it would be a real shame if we didn't run a, a presidential candidate. I mean, that would be horrible. I think, I think that last option sounds like the, uh, the best way to make lemonade um, out of lemons. Uh, but uh, who knows, maybe this thing could totally, you know, stop by mid-may and, and we just continue on as as though nothing happened uh who that's knows true. that's very true or we can just put uh ipads on roombas and just send them through the convention <laughs> <laughs> that's a dystopian nightmare just ipads on roombas that's society yeah. <laughs> ipads on what roombas you know that uh <laughs> vacuum cleaner that's uh oh. automatic <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> or we meet on like a minecraft server and we have an avatar and we just kind of go ahead and <laughs> make the procession yeah this whole thing is uh i would say will change the way we do a great many of things for sure and it's the impact of it will be long lasting um what do you what do you see the future of uh society after the corona apocalypse is over that's a fascinating question because, you know, it doesn't look like it's going to just disappear. Right. Uh, now, it, I guess it's possible with hot weather. That's what people are saying, that viruses tend to go away. But would it go away entirely? And then at what point do you just play the odds? Let's, let's say that we go into June and one in every 50 person is getting it. Well, do you go to a conference where there's 100 people there and right. play the odds? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it seems to me that, that, you know, until they come up with a vaccine, this could be a real life changer. I don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, as to where I, I, you know, I was going to conventions. I was, <laughs> I mean, two weeks ago, I went to the Illinois convention, uh, on a, I guess it was a right Friday on. night, right. drove to Chicago, caught a seven o'clock flight in the morning to Richmond, 
did the Virginia LP convention and the next day did the, did the Maryland one. And I said, you know, if I don't catch this thing, it's going to be a miracle. <laughs> I passed my 14 day uh, period, but the Texas uh, state convention is still scheduled. And that's in about, I don't know, two weeks or so. Wow. And I'm asking myself, well, if they have it and, and the, the state lets them have it, should I go down there? Should I wear, if I do, do I wear a mask while I'm debating? I mean, I don't know. You know, is it, yeah. is it worth risking your life for it? I, I just, I don't know. Right. Well, yeah. we look forward to seeing how you respond to a great many of these uh, <laughs> issues, uh, God willing. And we wish you uh, a great success on this nomination. I, I think you have a great uh, recorded track of established uh, libertarian principles and the way you pursue this. Um, I think it's uh, something that you can find absent through many other candidates. Uh, you've been fighting this fight for a long time. You know the war, you know the battles. Um, and as a lawyer, you know, I guess you can say like the legal speak and how to approach a lot of these issues. Um, I think um, that's something that I miss from other candidates. Um, you bring with you also the uh, advocacy in the, of the Mises Caucus. <laughs> that's true. Well, they've been fantastic. I mean, this, this bunch of, I mean, they're really, I think they're all young people from what I can tell, uh, like in your twenties. <laughs> and it, it's just been fantastic seeing their passion. And, Cause it reminds me of me when I was like, I discovered libertarianism at about 27 and man, I was passionate. I mean, I, I couldn't understand why the whole world didn't, wasn't a libertarian and I, <laughs> I was going to make can't you sure. get it. Exactly. <laughs> so at every convention, I've got like three or four people saying, coming up right up to me immediately. Mr. Hornberger, we're Mises Caucus. We're here to support you. Tell us what you want us to do. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm I'm one of the Mises Caucus guys that I pr that probably said that to you. And uh, I think I think a lot of us, like Mike Heiss and um, you know the, the guys who've gotten involved, and, and all the folks who've gotten involved. I mean, we experienced that surge of the Ron Paul moment there in 2008 and 2012, and we kind of wanted more of that, you know, and uh, so that's where our energy is coming from, I think more than anything. And, uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I've just been disappointed with the past eight years and how these other populism has kind of, you know, gotten more popular and, uh, you know, more of, um, the Tucker Carlson kind of conservatism has gotten more popular. So I'm, I'm more excited to put our message out there and, uh, get everybody hyped up, you know, for our, our, uh, principles. See, that's the way I feel. I mean, I mean, you know, if people want to run a Republican light campaign, reform, 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 I'm not your guy. But if you want to run a pure libertarian campaign where, where we go into battle with, with who we are, okay, if we go, this, this is what I've been telling the party. I said, look, if you want to play it safe, go with a Republican light campaign uh, that you'll get your 3%, 4%. Okay. And, and people like celebrate, wow, we get 3%. Are you kidding me? We've been here 49 years as a party and we're celebrating 3%. And I say, let's roll the dice and, and be bold that, mm. that let's run a pure libertarian campaign against these people. And if we go down at 1%, that's, that's what, what some of the people are saying. Oh, it's so risky. We're going to go back to 1%. And I say, okay, so what? I mean, it, it's, to me, it's worth the risk because when you act boldly, you have a chance for the big payoff. You play it safe, you'll never get the big payoff. Right. You this take all... the risk, you roll the dice, man, let's go for it. That's what I'm saying this time around. Now, Ron Paul, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, he is one of my real life heroes. He wrote the introduction to my campaign book, uh, A Passion for Liberty, and it's available on Amazon. Um, and I campaigned for Ron heavily in 2008. I mean, he just charges up my batteries. He's electric. And I went up door to door in New Hampshire, which was quite a big deal because I hate cold weather. <laughs> <laughs> this is before the New Hampshire primary. Uh, and I did a couple of speeches for him in Philadelphia and Tennessee. And yeah, man, he was fantastic. So I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about here about Ron. <laughs> After uh, all of this is over and you become president, would you uh, grace us for an opportunity uh, to go shooting with us sometime in some Virginia outdoor range? <laughs> 
Hey man, look, if I'm president, how much you guys going to offer? <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm not going to cash in on this thing? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get, we'll get uh, some, you know, donations from uh, major corporations like Altria. Altria is based in Richmond. Maybe they can hook us up. <laughs> it would be an honor and a pleasure to go out shooting with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, gracing us to presence in your time. I know there's a, uh, it's a time crunch and there's a lot of wild stuff that's happening, especially with this coronavirus wild card thrown into the mix but uh it's great to see that you're resilient and pushing forth and all i have to say is um godspeed mr uh hornberger thank you all thank you uh, cal and john I greatly enjoyed the visit with you guys and look forward to coming back with you at a later date for thanks. those listening thanks for watching check out uh jacobs hornberger's website and his platform see you liberated get off my property Oh, yeah. And wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs>